Hauptquartier. Ja, ja, der ist anwesend. Ähm, Herr Nadell, ähm, ja? hier ist ein Gespräch auf Leitung 2. Es geht um irgendwas mit Hitler. Haben Sie eine Sekunde? Oh, uh, a line two. Okay, yeah, sure, I'll take it. Uh, thank you, Anna. Thank you. Hello. Wait, wait, slow down. The Soviets are only 50 kilometers from Hitler himself. Wait, wait, wait. How fast can the Soviets go in like a day? 60 kilometers. Man, capturing Hitler. Yeah, yeah, that would be kind of a big deal. Yeah. Uh, well, let me know, okay? Yeah, cool. All right. Thanks for calling. Bye. February 19th, 1943. The Red Army has been on the move since November, but recently has been pouring out of the Donbass and the region to its north. And this week, they retake two major strategic prizes, Kharkov and Rostov. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Battle of Guadalcanal came to an end after six months with the evacuation of the final Japanese troops from the island. They managed to evacuate them without any serious losses. But the Germans were really on the run on the entire southern half of the Eastern Front, as the remarkable Soviet attacks continued taking ground everywhere. And as you may guess, those attacks continue this week. In the Caucasus, after the fall of Krasnodar, Stavka hopes the Red Army can catch most of German 17th Army with a big pincer movement. But all week long, 17th Army runs phased withdrawals that keep them just ahead of Petrov's and Maslenikov's advancing forces. At the gateway to the Caucasus, on the 14th, the Red Army liberates Rostov. The industrial town of Voroshilovgrad also falls. And another major prize towards the other end of the moving front lines is taken the 16th when the Red Army liberates Kharkov. The axis there fall back towards Poltava, and by the end of the week, the road and railway between Kharkov and Kursk are cleared of Axis forces. But you know, even with the fall of Rostov and Kharkov, Robert Cetino has this to say. From our perspective today, It is possible to see signs that all these Soviet offensives were reaching what Clausewitz had called the culmination point, the moment at which offensive power begins to wear down, friction reasserts itself, and the machine eventually stops. He points out that despite being one of the most successful campaigns in modern military history, starting on the Volga, taking the Don Bend, crossing all along the Don, and now aiming at the Dnieper, all this time, And all that distance has worn the formations down to half the combat strength they began with. And as for the Germans, groups Hollet, Fretter Pico, and Lanz are more mobile than the destroyed German 6th Army or Italian 8th Army were, and they have mostly restored a front line. Well, I say Group Lanz, but that's actually not any longer a thing because of Kharkov. It's kind of an anticlimax, but Paul Hauser, in charge of that city's defense under Group Lanz, in Cetino's magnificent words, took one look at the situation maps with Soviet tank corps about to bypass him north and south of the city and decided to skedaddle. You'd think Hauser would be in trouble for violating Hitler's fight to the last man rule, but he isn't. Lanz is dismissed since Hitler says he sanctioned Hauser's withdrawal. The group is now under Werner Kempf and his group Kempf. More on Hauser another time. The Soviet Southern Front has a mission to reach the Meuse River by the 17th so that its attacks can be integrated with those further north and northwest, the attacks of the Southwestern Front. Thing is, they do get there, but by that time, with Stavka shifting focus to the Kharkov and northern Donbass areas, Southern Front has changed its center of gravity north from the Rostov axis like 60 kilometers or so to its right wing, which has unfortunately been way weaker than the left during the whole Rostov action. So Rodion Malinovsky has to waste time and resources shuffling mobile forces from one wing to the other. He's also running out of fuel and ammunition, and the thaw on the 16th turns the roads into liquid mud. The upshot of all this is that Southern Front's offensive operations come to a halt the 18th when they go over to the defensive. Well, David Glantz says in his book Operation Don's Main Attack, that pretty much all secondary sources do say the 18th they go over to defense, 
But he points out that daily combat journals show that this is not the case, and the 18th is an arbitrarily chosen day. And, driven by necessity, optimism, vengeance, or sheer stubbornness, the Southern Front's bloody attacks along the river would persist through and past the end of the month. As for the Axis moves, I talked last week about Erich von Manstein's plans to send the 1st and 4th Panzer Armies north, shorten his lines by withdrawing behind the Meuse River, and then launching a counteroffensive. He is in a race against the clock. Army Group Dawn is renamed Army Group South, and Army Groups A and B are dissolved. So Manstein now has what he actually wanted back in late November when he was put in charge of launching a relief operation towards Stalingrad. He has command of the whole theater. That part of 2nd Army not cut off northwest of Voronezh is transferred to Army Group Center. And by now, his units have pulled back successfully. Group Hollet is behind the Mius. Group Freter Pico, which is now 30th Corps, is on its left. Eberhard von Mackensen's 1st Panzer Army is on their left. But, but, you know, that army has marched all the way from the Caucasus to get here. And they have to fight as soon as they arrive here. Against Markian Popov's mobile forces coming south from Lysychansk and Slavyansk. The Soviets break right through the German positions and there is some panic until Popov's forces eventually find themselves surrounded. But the rest of Nikolai Vatutin's southwestern front is pouring through the 150-kilometer hole between Kharkov and Slavyansk, heading west and southwest towards the Dnieper. The 6th Army on the right, 1st Guards on the left. There is no German formation of any significant size between them and Zaporozhye, which is headquarters to both Manstein's army group and Luftflotte Führ. Today, the 19th, the Soviet advance armor reaches Sinelnikovo, which cuts the rail traffic between Dnipropetrovsk and Stalino, threatening the supply for the entire German southern wing. At this time, Adolf Hitler himself is visiting Manstein, just 50 kilometers from the Soviet advance. Yep. He arrives the 17th, and he is now bundled aboard a plane and flown out of there as quickly as possible. The Soviets did not know how close they had come to bagging the enemy supremo, of course, but they did know a number of other things. Intelligence was flowing into front and army headquarters alike of massive German troop movements to the west which all levels of Soviet command, from Vatutin on down, interpreted as another sign of a wild and desperate German flight for the Dnieper crossings. Army commanders urged their men on with redoubled urgency. The enemy was on the run and on the ropes. But if the Axis are losing ground in the Soviet Union, they are taking and consolidating it in North Africa. The fight for Sidi Bouzid takes place this week, with the 10th Panzers attacking the Americans, the 14th, under cover of a sandstorm. American counterattacks the 15th see their forces trapped between two panzer divisions with over 80 tanks. The Americans lose 46 tanks that day. Over the next 48 hours, the Axis advance and occupy Svetla, which the Allies have already abandoned. Now, on the 15th, Elvin Rommel sends elements of the 15th Panzers and some Italian armor to take Gafsa. But when they eventually arrive, the Americans have already pulled out. On the 17th, Rommel enters Feriana. The Americans have concentrated at the Kasserin and Sabiba passes, having lost 2,500 men and over 100 tanks. The Axis pretty much control all of Tunisia now. So what's next? Should they just wait for British 8th Army to arrive in force at Mareth? Rommel wants to take advantage of the inexperienced Americans but German and Italian high command hesitate. His plan is to attack in force through the Kasserine Pass and hit the Americans hard at Tebessa, taking their supplies. This would sabotage any possible Allied attack on the coastal corridor between Tunis and Mareth, and also threaten the whole southern flank of the British First Army to the north. Well, the 18th, Rommel gives his plans to smiling Albert Kesselring, who approves them and sends them to Commando Supremo in Rome. Today, they give Rommel their somewhat revised plans and say, go for it. They want to give him the 10th and 21st Panzer Divisions from von Arnhem's army and attack through Kasserin and Sabiba passes towards the north, clearing the western dorsal and threatening 1st Army. Rommel does not like this because first of all, it would disperse their forces. And second, and most of all, if it is not a success, 
then their own flanks are exposed and they still won't have gone after the much needed supplies at Tabasa. Well, be that as it may, today Rommel orders his assault group from Feriana to attack the Kasserine Pass. The 21st Panzers will hit the pass east of Kasserine and make for Sbiba. I imagine we'll see how it turns out next week. As for Bernard Montgomery's 8th Army, by the 16th, it is only a few kilometers south of the Marath Line. Now, this position was built in the 1930s to be a possible defense line against Italian attacks from Tripolitania. But it's actually just a few dozen pillboxes near the coast and some fortified positions in the mountains. The Allies are on the move in Burma as well this week. On the 14th, the Chindits cross the Chindwin, and on the 18th, cut the railway between Mandalay and Mietkina. This is the second wave of arrivals, 2,000 men of the northern group of the two groups I mentioned last week. The thing is, the southern group is supposed to be two days ahead of them, but they soon fall behind instead. They skirmish with a Japanese patrol, which alerts the Japanese that they're around, and the Japanese open up with mortars, which panics both the supply mules and their drivers, and everybody stampedes, so they lose three days just getting it back together. But what of Allied plans far to the southeast in the Solomon Islands? Guadalcanal was evacuated by the Japanese and conceded to the Americans last week. There are, however, still individuals and even groups of Japanese there, though most encounters with them end this week. Spoiler, the last known survivor will not surrender until 1947. You know, the past couple months on the island, the Americans have had naval and aerial superiority, and they certainly had way more combat strength than the starving men of Harukichi Hayakutaki's 17th Army. Why then were they not defeated and managed to evacuate? Certainly Hayakutaki himself thought that a strong attack towards Cape Esperance would have finished him off. Why did they fail to launch such an attack? Well, Richard Frank has this to offer. The failure, if such it was, has two components. The first of these is the small relative size of the forces engaged in the pincers drive on Cape Esperance. The second component is the ponderous pace of advance of these forces, which in turn is linked to terrain and logistical factors. But with the full benefit of hindsight, it is more accurate to attribute Patch's decisions in the pursuit of 17th Army not to a want of skills or imagination, but to a fundamental misreading of Japanese intentions, which was not unique. As Nimitz confessed in his report, up until the last moment, it appeared the Japanese were attempting a major reinforcement effort. Only skill in keeping their plans disguised and bold celerity in carrying them out enable the Japanese to withdraw the remnants of the Guadalcanal garrison. Not until all organized forces had been evacuated on the 8th of February did we realize the purpose of their air and naval dispositions. On the 16th, Allied forces concentrate on Guadalcanal for Operation Clean Slate to take the Russell Islands, though on the 18th, American recon over the Russells says they have already been evacuated. Oh, and that same day, Japanese installations on Atu Island in the Aleutian Islands are shelled by two cruisers and four destroyers. And there I will end the week, with Axis advances in Tunisia, but major Soviet ones in the southwestern USSR, which include taking or liberating the twin prizes of Kharkov and Rostov, and something else from France. On the 16th, Vichy French Prime Minister Pierre Laval and Justice Minister Joseph Barthélemy formally create the STO, Service du Travail Obligatoire, which is to basically send hundreds of thousands of Frenchmen to Germany to work as slave labor. Th this system has sort of been in effect since last summer, with the idea that for every three volunteers for service, one French POW would be released by the Germans. But a law from last September required able-bodied men aged 18 to 50 and single women 21 to 35 to do any work their government deems necessary. Well, Fritz Saukel, who's in charge of the Labor Department for the Reich in occupied territory, decided January 1st he requires another quarter of a million French workers to join the quarter million already working in Germany by mid-March. So this law today has all males over 20 
possibly subject to slave labor, but in actual practice, today's regulations subject basically all males aged 20 to 23 to actual service. They are obliged to go to work in Germany as a substitute for military service. I'm going to end today with another quote about the fight for Guadalcanal, this one from Gerhard Weinberg's A World at Arms. What did it all mean? The Americans learned here, as in Papua, that the Japanese were hard fighters, but not invincible. When the odds were reasonable and the leadership competent, the Allies could hold and defeat the seemingly invincible Imperial Army and Navy, but obviously only at great cost. It would be a very long and very tough fight. As for the Japanese, they had seen that their basic strategy of defending the perimeter of their newly won empire was evidently not working the way they had planned. The assumption had been that the Americans would be unwilling to pay the price in blood and treasure to retake islands of which they had never heard to be returned to allies for whose colonial empires they had only disdain. Here was proof that they would. And in the face of this, the leaders in Tokyo displayed a bankruptcy of strategic thinking because there is no plan B. It was the Marines who began and for the most part fought the land battle of Guadalcanal for the Americans. We did a history episode about the Marines, well, not just the American Marines, but a bunch of nations. And you can check that out right here. And here are our most recently commissioned officers in the Time Ghost Army. The Time Ghost Army member of the week is David G. Bever. We are able to do this and to do that and to do like her stuff, uh, to do all of our stuff and, and to do Astrid's, right Astrid? Hello. To do that, thanks to the Time Ghost Army. So join the army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. And do not forget to subscribe. See you next time. Mm -hmm.